I was look, I was talking to my neighbor yesterday. I'm looking out at his tree that I can see across the way there. And I was talking with him about his trees. You remember last year we had that windstorm. He had two, uh, I think those are fruitless pear trees in his front yard. He had two of them. They were kind of like twins. And the one on the right was even healthier than the one on the left. And we had that windstorm that came through and blew that one completely over. And I was telling him yesterday, I said, man, I just look over there, and it just makes me sick to see that tree gone. And he was like, yeah, the same thing. So spring is here, though, and the winds will blow. Easter has come, but it's not gone. I'll say it again. Easter has come, but it's not gone. It never leaves us. The power of the resurrection is our foundation as believers today. Without it, we may as well just go home and give up hope. But with it, it is our hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And last Sunday, what a great Sunday we had. We celebrated once again, but we need to celebrate Easter every day. We need to celebrate the resurrection every day. When we wake up, thank you, Lord, I've been resurrected I've been changed. I've been made new. I'm a new man. I'm a new woman. Whatever God has in plan for me, I want to follow. So, you know, in, on Easter, churches around the world experience huge numbers. Most of the time, the numbers double. What your, what your attendance is, usually Easter, you can say, well, we're going to double that. Uh, we're going to double our regular attendance. And that is typical around the world as people gather to worship the Lord. But it's not over. <laughs> it's not over. It's, it's ongoing. This, this powerful message of the resurrection is alive and well in believers today. And it's, it's changing us. It's molding us. It's shaping us into the image of Christ. We're becoming more like Him as we follow Him. And so we celebrate that. The Easter, uh, we're celebrating the greatest victory ever won when we, when we celebrate the resurrection. The victory over sin and the victory over death. What a great victory. And I want to share with you as we begin this morning a few scriptures that testify to this truth. John chapter 11 verse 25 testifies to the power of the resurrection. Jesus himself says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. Can't believe I didn't get an amen. <laughs> even though he lives, even though he may die, he shall live. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Are y'all awake this morning? Think about that. John 5, 24 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and you shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. Amen. We are alive in Him this morning. We have life in Christ because of what the resurrection did for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, in verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal has to put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But, I love that but, don't you? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Do you remember in high school? Some of you are still there. You go to a football game, a basketball game, and it's V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. That's the Eagles battle cry. Don't, no, no disrespect, Andrew. And I was a Canyon Eagle. Yeah. 
And, and, and that's excitement, man. We would go to the games and we would yell that, you know, and, and, and hug on each other when, we, when our teams won the victory. That's the kind of excitement that we need to have as a church. We have victory. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, In so much as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, talking about Jesus, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Praise the Lord. That's where you say, praise the Lord. Because he has defeated the devil, the enemy. He's defeated. He has no power over the Christian's life. We don't have to be afraid of dying. We don't have to be afraid of death. As I said in Sunday school this morning, there is nothing that we have to be worried about as Christians. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Because we're going to wake up tomorrow and there's going to be things arise that we're going to want to worry about. But I'm telling you, there's no need to worry. We've got to address things, absolutely. We've got to look at life and we've got to live here. We've got to occupy until He comes, until we're changed when that trumpet sounds, as the Scripture says. But until that time, when we face difficulty and adversity, let's lift those things up to the Lord. Why? Because we have the victory already. We have the victory. You know, we, 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 we mourn the loss of our loved ones. And we've lost several over the past several years. We're saddened about that. We miss them. But, you know, for when we think about it, they have victory in Christ and they're in heaven today. They're living with the Lord. And, and, and yes, we miss them and, and, and we have great memories but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Why? Because we have the victory in Christ Jesus. Death is not the end. It's the beginning of eternity. Praise the Lord, folks. This victory over sin and death is exciting. It's something to be excited about every day of the year, not just Easter. I'm praying that our church would fill with people that are excited about that, that they realize what has happened because of the resurrection, that their lives are so radically changed by the, the realization of salvation through Christ Jesus that they want to be in church every time they can. They want to be in Bible study every time they can. Why? Because they're excited and they want to grow. They want to move forward in their faith. Folks, this was an unexpected victory that morning of the resurrection. The disciples didn't foresee it, even though Christ had told them multiple times, I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise again on the third day. They didn't expect it. And definitely the religious leaders didn't expect it as they plotted to kill Jesus Christ. From the world's standpoint, it was a lopsided battle. The religious leaders, they were backed by the Roman government at the time. It was a slam dunk for the devil, so he thought. <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? One of the most familiar stories in the Bible is David and Goliath. That was a lopsided battle as well. Goliath was nine feet tall. He had been a warrior from his, from his youngest years. He had a, uh, a, 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 an armor bearer in front of him. He had a, a, a spear that was the size of a weaver's beam. I can't remember how much the head of that thing weighed, but it was heavy. You and I probably have trouble even picking the spear up, but he could throw it like a twig. He was so big. And here comes David with the sling and five stones, no armor. I'm not a gambling man, but if I were in a situation like that, who would you put money on? What would be the odds? Probably 100 to 1. Against David, unless <laughs> you knew the God of Israel. And David knew the God of Israel. He went against that giant with no armor, just faith in the Lord. He, in the world's point of view, he didn't stand a chance. The powers of the world were against him. 
but he won the battle. David wins the victory. We, we know the rest of the story, don't we? That stone sunk into Goliath's head, supernaturally powered by the power of God, accurate man. David, God had prepared David for this moment, and he had made the way for victory for Israel. Same thing happened that morning of the resurrection. It looks like Jesus didn't stand a chance. The powers of hell were poised against him. The religious leaders, the Roman Empire, they were all against him. There was a, hundreds of voices crying out that day, crucify him, crucify him. But three days later, he was raised from the dead. I can hear my granddad shouting <laughs> at that point. He raised from the dead on the third day. They didn't expect it. It was a lopsided battle. But folks, the Bible is filled with the underdog winning. And we praise God this morning. That's why it's so exciting to recognize what the resurrection is all about and to celebrate it every day, not just one day a year. Jerusalem, but after that, that resurrection, as far as the world was concerned, nothing had changed. Everything was exactly the same. Tiberius was still the emperor in Rome. Pontius Pilate was still the governor in Judea. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were still squabbling among themselves. Jerusalem was still Jerusalem. As far as the world knew, nothing had changed. They just went on as, as nothing had ever changed. But folks, it had changed. The resurrection had changed those disciples' lives. They, it made a difference in the lives of them. Men and women who followed the resurrected Christ would never be the same. The world might look the same, but the way in which they lived would never be the same again. For Jesus was alive. He had won the victory and they had seen Him. He had appeared to them. Physically, and they, they were in awe. They were amazed at what was happened. He had their attention, didn't he? Paul could write, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Think about the victory that has been won this morning. Think about it. Praise the Lord. Jesus is alive. We have victory over sin. We have victory over death. The Cross of Victory. Uh, John Scott wrote a book, The Cross of Christ. He says this. He says, I quote, It is impossible to read the New Testament without being impressed by the atmosphere of joyful confidence, confidence which pervades it and which stands out in relief against the rather superficial religion that often passes for Christianity today. He goes on to say there was no defeatism about the early Christians. They spoke rather of victory. They spoke of victory, for if they spoke of victory, they knew they owed it to the victorious Jesus. It is He who overcame, has triumphed, and moreover, did it by the cross. That same kind of spirit needs to be in our hearts, in our church today. We need to be so excited about the chance to come together as believers and look into God's Word and, and, and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit as we gather together. You know, the enemy tried to stall that out this past year. He tried to quash that. And he's still trying it. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. In some states like California, they're still restricting. I didn't even understand that, but Kay mentioned that they're trying to restrict house churches in California. <laughs> That's the enemy. But folks, we have the victory. We can come against that in the name of Jesus and rejoice because of that persecution. So that's, this spirit of, of victory needs to be in the church today. There ought to be a spirit of excitement and joy because Christ has won. The battle has been won. No more do we have to fear death or the great unknown. No more do we have to listen, uh, live our lives in fear. 
We're not alone. We don't have to be frustrated, unsure. The one who guides us, Jesus, he's alive. He's alive. And he's willing, he's ready to help us. I know we face difficulty. We face adversity. And the flesh wants to be uh, torn up about it. But that's when we need to rely upon the victory that Christ has won. With all this in mind, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 21 and I'll get to my sermon. This is a uh, familiar passage. This is the third time we see in this passage where Jesus appeared to his uh, disciples after his resurrection. It's the miraculous catch of fish. This is the second miraculous catch. The first one we see in the scriptures was when Jesus, before uh, he went to the cross, he, there was a catch of fish there. Now this is the second one we find in the scriptures in John chapter 21 verses 1 through 14. Let me read it to you. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter called the twin, Nathaniel, Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to them, we're going with you also. They didn't know what to do. Let me stop there for a minute. Jesus had told them he was, you know, he was going to, come to them, but, but they were a little frustrated at this point, still not knowing what to do, and, and so they're just going back to fishing. <laughs> and his, his friend said, well, we're just going with you. They went out, and immediately they got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. That's the most depressing thing, to go fishing and catch nothing. They caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. In verse 5, he said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not too far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw the fire and the coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you guys have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. We're... In this life, there's going to be times where we are confused, where we are discouraged. That's when we really need to lean in and ask the Lord to appear to us. Appear. That's what he did. He appeared on the, the bank. They had been out there. They were frustrated. They were fishing, and, and he brought them the ultimate fish finder. I went fishing a couple Sundays ago. Don't tell everybody that, that I went fishing on Sunday. I was on vacation, right? We can do that once in a while and not have to go to the altar and repent that we went fishing on Sunday. But I went fishing and we cheated. We got a, a guide to take us out in a boat and he had this fish finder. This thing was about this bigger than my iPad. It was big. And he could see where the fish were. And he'd go, and we'd go to that spot where he, you know, he knew we'd be out in the middle of the lake. How do you know that? But he could also see on that fish finder the topography of the bottom of the, the lake. And he knew where the fish would be at that time with a certain temperature of the water. This guy was a pro. He was voted the best guide on Lake Texoma in 2019, I think. Maybe 2020. I can't remember. I saw the sign. But we just happened to find him on the Internet. Nothing, you know, I didn't know about him, but. 
anyway, I won't advertise for him. I'm not going to give his name, but he knew where to go, and he had the equipment to find the fish, and Jesus told his disciples, just put it on the right side. Jesus knew where those fish were. He probably miraculously created them or somehow corralled them to come right there, 153 of them, into that net. However he did it, he knew where to direct them, and he appeared to them. He wanted to get them excited again about who he was and what has happened, the, the resurrection, and sometimes we need that appearance, don't we? of Jesus in our lives, the Holy Spirit, to come and say, I'm alive. I'm with you. I know you're going through a confusing time right now, but I'm here. Get excited. You're going to overcome this. We're working on a choir song that says, God says you're going to make it. I invite you to come and help us sing it. It's an exciting song. It's a great song. But God knew, and He wants us to understand that when we go through those confusing times. You're going to make it. You're going to get victory. You're going to catch the fish. We got out there on the lake that a uh, couple of weeks ago, and, and we got to one point where the fish stopped biting, and the guide said, well, we're moving. And he'd, he'd moved to another place. It was cold that morning, and, and we didn't want to move because when you move on the lake and it's cold, it gets colder, and that wind blows on your face. And my sister-in-law, I hope she's listening today, she, she's like, I don't want to move. She, she wanted to stay there and fish, but the fish stopped biting, so we're moving. We're going to another spot. And then we get to that spot, and sure enough, we start catching fish. But I was worried at one point that we'd got out there on this lake and spent the money to get this guide, and we weren't going to catch a bunch of fish. That's what we expected to do, but, but praise the Lord, we did. God wants to get us excited, doesn't He? He wants to, us to recognize that the the, the victory has been won. He's alive. He's working in our lives today. There's five lessons. I know we've got 15 minutes. You're going five points. You usually, usually just have three, and you've already preached half an hour. But these will go quick, I promise you. But they're important lessons that we need to learn from this passage of Scripture. The first lesson we need to learn is the importance of obedience. They had fished all night. They, had ex they were experienced fishermen. They knew what they were doing. I'm sure they had tried everything they knew. But they had caught nothing. I can imagine how tired and frustrated and hungry they would have been. They caught nothing. And now not only were they hungry, they were going to the they were have to go back to the shore and they didn't have any fish to eat. But here appears Jesus. Sometimes as Christians and fishers of men, we get tired and frustrated too, don't we? That's a reality. But we, we need to go back and read this story and realize what God wants of us in those times. He just simply wants us to do what He has told us to do, obedience. They were tired, they were frustrated, and He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. You know, the first story... When he tells them to cast the net on the other side of the boat, they said, we fished all night and caught nothing. But here, in this passage, it's, they just drop it over. <laughs> no questions asked. Obedience. That's what we need to do. It doesn't make sense, Lord. Have you ever said that to him? It doesn't make sense what you're asking me to do. We just need to be obedient. He doesn't require us to be experts. He's the expert. He's the guide. He's the one that's making the way, making it possible for us to navigate through the, the adversities that this life brings upon us. He just wants us to obey Him. They had gifts and talents. They knew how to cast the net. They knew how to drop it in there, yes? And so He said, use your talent, drop it on this side of the boat, so he's telling us to obey. God has gifted each and every one of us with different talents. And he wants us to use them for his glory. So we just have to obey. There were two farmers. One of them wanted to buy a mule. One of them put his mule for sale in the newspaper. And so they got together and they began to talk. They got together one day and, and they were talking about different things about farming 
And finally, the, the, the one that um, came to, to look at the mule, asked him, okay, where's your mule? Is, is he a good worker? The guy said, yeah, he does a great day's work. He said, does he listen and obey commands? Uh, yes, he does. He listens to commands. Well, can we go hook him up? Can I give him a test drive is what he was saying. Sure, sure. So they got the harness. They got, the, they got it on the mule. They got the, the plow on him. And, and, and the, 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 the buyer, the prospective buyer, picks up the reins. He says, giddy up. And that mule just stands there. He looks over at the owner and he says, I thought you said this mule obeys commands. The owner said, he does. The owner went over and picked up a two by four and he went and got in front of that mule and just smacked him with all he had. He came back. He said, try it again. Giddy up. And the mule started. The guy said, oh, okay. He said, he listens to every commands, but you have to get his attention. The Lord wants to get our attention. I hope he doesn't have to smack us upside the head with a two by four. <laughs> he's, got us, he's got our attention, folks. He raised from the dead. He's alive. He's real. He's living in our lives. He wants to be a part of the things that we do. Does he have your attention? Or are you a stubborn old mule? I was tempted to use, never mind. Jesus had the disciples' attention. He knew. He knew how to get their attention. That, that morning on the, on the side of, of the, the shore, he, they caught 153 fish, just like that. The net wasn't even breaking. Miraculous catch. Miraculous, they, they drug it in. Peter just jumped out of the boat. I love his excitement. He just plunged into the water. I'm going to get there. I want to go see Jesus. He had a special reason to see him, right? Because he had denied Christ. He felt uh, disassociated with Jesus in Christianity because of his mistake that he had made. But Jesus had his attention. And they got to the side of the, uh, the bank. And this comes to the next point here. Number two, God provides. God provides. I don't know about you, but if I'd been throwing a net out into the sea all night long, my stomach would be ready to rebel. Hungry for something to eat, and they had nothing. But they had been fishing all night. They were dis discouraged, they were tired, and they were hungry. But Jesus does something about it. He not only calls them and says, come on over, he's got fish ready. I wonder if he caught them himself. He had bread ready. He, he had food. He provided for them. So God will provide. He provided a greater catch than they would have ever imagined. And besides that, he made a meal and he had it ready. Isn't that great to come home and get to the house and, and your, your mom or your wife has dinner ready and you don't have to do a thing? That's great, isn't it? The Lord had it ready. Folks, he will provide. Doesn't that suggest that whenever we're in need or hurt or cold or lonely or sad or whatever emotion we're experiencing, the Lord has what we need and he'll provide it? He's alive, folks. He's real. Psalm 81.10 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Listen to this. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Valerie and I went to uh, Lake Valacido in Durango last summer, and we stayed in this little cabin. One had one room, a tiny little kitchen, and a little uh, kind of a living area. But at, on the outside, on the front of this, was a little mud. I can't remember the name of the birds, but they make these little mud nests. You've seen them. Uh, they eat mosquitoes. That's what they do. That's how they live. That's, they're good. And they, they had built this little nest right above the door. And there was about five or six little chicks in there. 
and mom and dad were flying out eating mosquitoes over the lake. We were right up next to the lake, maybe 50 yards from the lake. And, and those, the, the mom and dad birds, you could see them all flying out over the water, eating, you know, catching mosquitoes. And then they would come back to the nest. And as soon as the, those little chicks were sitting at the edge of the nest, and they were sitting there, and as soon as they saw, even if it wasn't mom and dad, if they saw another bird flying that direction, their mouths just went, Wah! they were just, ah, open up and pushing on each other, trying to, trying to get to where mom would feed them first. That's what I thought about when I said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Mom and dad were providing for those little birds, and that's all they did. They worked all day. They just flew around and brought back, and those little chicks, uh, by the time we left there, some of those chicks were venturing out of the nest and flying themselves. But they'd come back to the nest. I don't know how they found it. They, they did. But mom and dad provided for them. Open your mouth wide. Jesus, God was saying here to the people, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Egypt is a picture of sin. That's what God did when Jesus resurrected from the grave. He brought us out of sin. He's brought us into new life. And we just need to open wide and receive because God provides. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Folks, he provides. And if, that's, if you can't get excited about that, I'm sorry. The third reason, that, or the third lesson that we, live, that we learn here is God doesn't give up. Right after these verses, beginning in verse 15, to the end of the chapter is a great story of the restoration of Peter. We don't have time to go there and read that this morning, but you remember what he said. They sat down, and, and Peter's sitting there, and, and Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I do. You know I do, Lord. He asked him that three times. God didn't give up on Peter because he made a mistake. He restored him. He doesn't he didn't give up on us. He reminded Peter of his great love for him. He encouraged him. And, and he said, now feed my sheep. I, I'm not giving up on you. In the same way, God doesn't give up on us. He's always there. When we stumble and fall and when we fail, he's there to pick us up, brush us off, and send us on our way again to serve him. It goes back to that obedience, doesn't it? Now be obedient and do what I've asked you to do. That's what he's telling us. Most of the time, well, I'll probably say all the time, when we fail, it's because we failed in obedience first, right? We've got to obey the Lord. He's going to provide when we do it, and then he's not going to give up on us when we fail or fall. William Brown, in his book, Welcome Stress, he said this, Failure is an event, never a person. Failure is an event. It's not who you are. You ask all these people in the world today, some of the greatest minds in the world, how many times they failed before they succeeded in what they were trying to do. It was an event. It was a moment in time. It's not who you are. Remember that. God doesn't give up. The fourth lesson, God is anxious to give us direction in life. He asks for obedience. He provides for us. He never gives up on us. And then he's anxious to give us direction in life. He's ready. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. Here we are in our neat little world, and we have it all figured out, right? We've got all these plans and we're, that we're making. But God says, but have you listened to my plan? Do you know what direction I want for you? Have you been sensitive to the Holy Spirit and His leading, who is striving to speak to you and minister to you and lead and guide and direct you? Folks, God is ready. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge your ways, or excuse me, in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. 
He's anxious to guide us and lead us. He wants us to listen. Open our ears, Lord. We sang that this morning, didn't we? And help us to listen. Help us to hear your voice and your direction, God. Psalm 37, 23, and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights. That's capital H-E. Delights. Look at that. Yeah, there it is. I couldn't find it. He delights. The Lord delights in his way. He, he wants to guide us and direct us. Though he may fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. God is ready to do that for you and I. I hope he has your attention, your obedience. He's going to provide for you. He's not going to forsake you. He's always going to be there. He's ready and willing and anxious to guide you. And number five, he wants us to be fishers of men. That's what we learned from this story. That's what he told them when he got to the end of this dialogue with them. He said, you caught all these fish, 153. I'm going to make you fishers of men. In Luke 5, 1 through 11, there's a similar story. We go back to that first miraculous catch. He turned to Peter in that story and he says, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Peter, that's when Peter says, Lord, we've done this all night. We haven't caught a thing. I don't understand why you're telling us to do it again. He's arguing with God. That never happens, right, with you or me, no. So they got into the sea, and, and they threw their nets, and they caught so many fish that their nets were breaking there. They had to get another boat to help come and bring it in. In Luke 5, 8 and 11, it says, When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up onto the shore, left everything, and followed him. Now remember, this story that I just read, this is before Christ's death and his resurrection. And they had left all. But in the story that we started with this morning, they'd, they'd gone back to fishing because of their confusion. But the Lord wanted to get them excited. Easter has come and passed, but it's not over. Let's get excited about what the Lord wants to do through us, through our church. We can have an impact on the lives of those around us for eternity's sake. I don't know about you. Guys are built to be heroes. Did you know that? And women are built to be saved. <laughs> Guys are meant to be the hero, and we want to do that. But ladies, that doesn't mean that you cannot be a fisher of men. You can use the gifts and talents that God has given you to bring in the harvest. So let's get out there. Let's get excited. The crowd of Easter is gone. But that doesn't change the fact that the resurrection has happened. And he's alive. There are a lot of people that are lonely, hurting, and in sin and, and fearful. You and I are rejoicing this morning because we're, we have the victory over sin. We don't have to fear. Doesn't it make sense that we share that with those around us and use the gifts and talents that he's given us to be obedient, recognizing that he's going to provide along the way, understanding if we make a mistake, he doesn't give up on us. Failure is an event, not a person. And God is willing and ready to give us direction, and he wants us to go fishing. It doesn't get any better than that. Not catching smelly old fish, but catching men and women and children for the Lord, bringing them into the kingdom of God. 
That's what we got to do, folks. If that's not a part of our plan, then we need to relook at the plan. Let's get excited. Does he have your attention? As you stand with me this morning, let's spend some time asking him, Lord, I need some guidance. I need that uh, fish finder, if you will. Supernatural fish finder. I need to know how to navigate in this life and find those people who need the Lord. We want that in our neighborhood. I'm praying more and more for our neighborhood here that God would help us to navigate, help us to step into people's lives and provide some bait out there that they will take a hold of. And that, that bait is Christ. It's the life of newness, the life of freedom from sin, freedom from fear. We have everything to offer. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning and I pray that you would help us. God, help us as a ministry to reach out to the lost. Lord, you've called us to do that. You've equipped us to do it. You're ready and willing. You're going to provide. You're never going to forsake us. And you want us to go out and go fishing. Lord, I pray that you would help us in the days, the months, the years to come before you return, Lord, to go out and find those who need Jesus Christ. To compel them. Going out into the byways, into the hedges, compelling them to come. Folks, we're going to get rejected. And Lord, you're going to be there with us. You're going to help us. You're going to help us. Lord, you know, you know who is going to receive this message. And Lord, use us to deliver it. Father, we thank you. Help us during those times of confusion, not knowing which way to turn. Show us your will and open our minds to you so that we can listen and obey you using the gifts and talents you've given us to bring in the harvest. It's going to take us all together, Lord, I know, and you're empowering this church to do that. And we thank you and praise you. Lord, we're so thankful for the fact that you have risen from the dead and you're alive. You've given us your Holy Spirit and now you're empowering us. You're exciting us, giving us the, the gumption to get moving, go forward and bring in the great catch that you have prepared, Lord. Lord, as we do this, we want to point everything, all the glory goes to you. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you this morning. Remember Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Come out and be a part of that. We are studying through the Old Testament at this time. We studied Solomon and his calling and his, his asking God uh, this past Wednesday. We're going to continue our study. Come out and be a part of that. We will have children's church and youth uh, will we'll be ministered to as well. So come out and be a part of those services. Any other word before we dismiss? Oh, the, the sacrament. Yes, our ushers, would you come for us this morning? And Jonelle, would you go to the piano? And thank you for passing that out and preparing the sacrament this morning. Praise the Lord. We celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and we're looking this morning at that sacrifice that he made on the cross. It paved the way for us. It made the way so that you and I can have complete freedom in Christ Jesus. His blood was shed for our sin. and We rejoice in that this morning. Thank you, Lord. We praise you this morning.
thank you, Lord. The Lord came to his disciples as he met with them and he had that conversation with them that was a little confusing to them when he said, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Again, he had told them that he was going to the cross, he would be crucified, he would raise again, but they didn't understand it. And now... The night before he's betrayed, the scripture says he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. So as we take this bread this morning, we're remembering his body that was broken. And then after the supper, he took the cup and he passed it around. And of course, they shared the same cup at that table. We have our own individual cups, but it doesn't matter. This blood represents his, or this, this, this juice represents his blood that was shed for us. And it's by his blood that we are cleansed and brought into this new life. And then all the benefits of his broken body, all the benefits of this restoration, him being the first fruits, the first to rise from the dead, that is now ours. And we rejoice in it. So let's take the cup. Remembering his blood that was shed for our body. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But the Lord paid the price. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you this morning for saving us and bringing us into your kingdom. Thank you for the blood that was shed. And our sins are cleansed. We are clean in your sight. And we can come into your presence and enjoy your, uh, your audience, your, your receptiveness to our coming into your presence, Lord. And I praise you for that. That is so great to have a God we can come to. And we have been made able to do that through what Christ did. And we thank you and praise you this morning. Thank you, Lord. We love you this morning and praise you today. Thank you, Lord. The scripture says that after they took that sacrament, they sung a hymn. I asked Valerie when we read that not too long ago, I wonder what they sang. <laughs> what we can sing this morning is, He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Praise the Lord. He is Lord. Lord, He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, sing it again and just worship him this morning. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's leave here this morning with that excitement, right? And that attitude of victory. We can have victory no matter what we're facing. Praise the Lord this morning. God bless you. Brother Arlen, would you dismiss us in prayer?